All right, good afternoon. I hope you've uh, had an opportunity to get an, some of this great uh, lunch that uh, Laura put forward for us. Uh, and I know the desserts were fantastic too. <clears throat> you might want to grab one before we start here. But uh, I'd like to at least start through the process here of the ISFFB Policy Board. Um, again, we have an agenda here. There's a couple of things that we've been asked to add to other business. Um, the hearing section will have a request for a letter, uh, approval of a letter to be written. Um, Adam Nowalski would like to uh, have a discussion about the summer flounder assessment. And Shanna will be giving a brief uh, <coughs> revised uh, timeline for the risk and uncertainty wor workshop that we uh, were considering at the spring meeting. Uh, are there any other uh, agenda items, changes to the agenda that people would like to add, modify? Seeing none, uh, is there any objection to approving the agenda as modified? Seeing no objection, the uh, agenda is approved by unanimous consent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in your briefing materials, there are proceedings from the October 2016 uh, uh, policy board. Are there any changes or additions to that, those proceedings? Seeing none, is there any objection to approving the proceedings? Uh, they're seeing no objection there the proceedings are approved by unanimous consent <clears throat> we also have time uh, an agenda item now for public comment for items not on the agenda uh, I have uh, a Lewis uh, Laredo uh, from the Marine Mammal Commission that's uh, asked for a few minutes to talk to uh, the policy board about the Marine Mammal Commission's uh, meeting that's going to be coming up. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis Leandro. I'm the Director of Communications for the, the Marine Mammal Commission. We're a small independent government agency located here in the D.C. area with oversight role over the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And in essence, what we do is we review and comment on actions, proposed actions by federal agencies such as NOAA that could impact marine mammals and the marine environment at large. For example, one of the areas that we focus on is fisheries. We participate in all seven of uh, the National Marine Fisheries Services take reduction teams. And our, our focus is very much to support sustainable fisheries practices. Um, we care deeply about this issue. Uh, we understand that fishing activities sometimes interact with marine mammal activities, and our focus is to minimize those interactions whenever possible. One of the issues that we focus on, for example, is addressing marine mammal backcatch on the global front. We, we realize this is a big problem, and uh, we work with the National Marine Fisheries Services and others to look for, for solutions. Um, we, we very much support the idea of leveling the playing field for U.S. fishermen. We recognize that in the United States, this really, um, we've done a fantastic job, frankly, uh, dealing with marine mammal bycatch. But globally, it's still a big problem, and, um, and so that's an area that we focus on. But the real reason why I'm here is, is to um, encourage you to participate in our upcoming annual meeting. So every year we have a public stakeholder annual meeting to bring together folks at the table to discuss regional issues of importance, again, that are related to marine mammals. Um, the results of these annual meetings is usually a list of recommendations that we provide to other federal agencies as well as Congress to take action on particular issues. Uh, our, our focus is very much on the science. We're very, sci very much science-based. And uh, this year in particular, we're going to be uh, focusing in the New England region. 
Um, and so our annual meeting is proposed to be in April 5th through 7th in the Woods Hole area. Um, we're, we're finalizing the agenda as we speak. We're just waiting to see what happens with the remaining of the fiscal year 17 budget. But we hope we can pull this together, and we would love to see you there. Um, two agenda items that we thought would be of interest to the Commission. One is interactions between North Atlantic right whales and fishing activity. Uh, in addition to having no fisheries folks there, we hope to bring folks from the Canadi Canadian government also to participate in that dis discussion as well as, of course, hopefully some of you and others from the fishing industry. And, um, and we will also be having a discussion about recovery uh, populations of marine mammals, particularly gray, gray seals in the New England area. And uh, again, discuss the issue, look for potential solutions, and collectively develop a list of recommendations that we can help advance. Thank you for the time. Very much appreciate you listening. Um, and uh, I've distributed uh, business cards and uh, one page of, uh, about us with the save the dates for the meeting. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And we hope that some of you will consider joining us um, if we can put together this uh, annual, annual meeting in April. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Louise. OK, we will now move on to uh, our next agenda item, which is an update that I'll provide of our uh, executive committee meeting this morning. Uh, we reviewed and approved uh, the fiscal year uh, 2016 audit. Uh, <clears throat> we also approved uh, a, a document called Standard Meeting Practices. This is something that came out of our uh, uh, meeting management uh, seminar uh, with Colette uh, last year where she made some suggestions on how to make us a more efficient and effective board uh, commission. We will be bringing that document uh, to the policy board in, in uh, the spring. Um, we also had a uh, report uh, from the Atlantic Coastal Statistics Program uh, from Mike Cahall. And uh, uh, it appears that our uh, integration of ACCSP into ASMSC is moving along quite smoothly. And there are a lot of great uh, uh, activities that are, are, are moving along in, uh, at a rapid pace here uh, to improve our fisheries dependent uh, data collection. The executive committee also uh, discussed the concept of boards versus sections. Uh, sections are created under <coughs> Amendment uh, 1 to the compact. Uh, we had a discussion as to whether uh, uh, sections are even needed anymore and the uh, uh, prevailing sentiment that we should uh, have things remain as is. And so we are going to continue to have uh, uh, the two uh, sections, uh, the shrimp section and the herring section, continue forward. Under other business, uh, we also approved uh, guidelines for state-housed employees of the commission. Uh, Emerson, <clears throat> we also had a discussion of uh, advisory panels and, uh, and board membership. Uh, we're going to be developing a white paper to try and uh, um, um, have a further discussion on this item. Um, and finally, uh, uh, John Bullard, a regional administrator from GARFO, uh, provided us an, an update on the uh, <coughs> current uh, the potential new uh, administration officials and also uh, a list of the uh, acting uh, uh, officials at the at NOAA level and at the National Marine Fisheries Service level. Um, are there any questions about the executive committee? Okay, seeing none, we'll now move on to item, agenda item number five. Uh, discuss illegal, act, illegal fishing activities and policies uh, for how it impacts quotas. And Jason McNamee asked to speak to this. Jay? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm just going to give kind of a brief intro as to why I had asked um, 
Tony and, and Bob to put this on the agenda. And then I think Tony's pulled together some info, so I'll pitch it over uh, to her. Um, but just to kind of set it up, we had had some uh, illegal harvest of striped bass that occurred a couple years ago and um, trying to figure out you know, where to park those fish and uh, talked with uh, the commission about it and told them that, that we thought we could accommodate it um, in our commercial quarter. They said that's perfectly fine. So we, we did that. Now, please understand it was not that many fish, um, I guess in a relative sense. So it kind of worked. Um, through time that we became aware that this was not a standard practice or policy and that people did different things or nothing at all with uh, fish that were seized. Um, I understand that there's a lot of um, difficulty with, you know, when the legal process is underway and all that sort of thing. But in the end, they're dead fish, they're removed fish, they can be counted, they should be accounted for in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, I also aware that some of the, um, I'll call them busts, just to sound cool, like we're on TV, uh, that have occurred have been massive uh, and would wipe out a, whole, a state's whole quota and, and that sort of thing. So it's not an easy thing uh, by any stretch, but um, I think there should be some standardized approach to how we deal with it. And so that's what I was hoping to um, start to generate that discussion, maybe um, develop a, put together a working group to kind of put together some ideas um, and go from there. So uh, I think Tony's got a, a little bit of info for us to take a look at. Thanks, Tony. Okay, Amy, we're ready. Um, and I don't, in looking into this, and originally I thought I'd be able to pull together a white paper on illegal harvest, but there's so many unknowns that I really didn't have enough information to get into the meat of a white paper on this. So as Jason just went over, um, illegal harvest does occur in both commercial and recreational sectors, but there are no standard practices and policies on how to treat those fish. So some of the questions that came to mind when I was thinking about this was, you know, how does a state define illegal harvest and, um, and, and taking that definition to both how do you define it in the commercial sector and how do you define it in the recreational sector and it may be a little bit different because in, <clears throat> in thinking about in the recreational sector you have illegally harvested fish you know outside of a season let's say that may not get counted into an MRIP survey but you also have illegally harvested fish in the sense of it's you know within the season but it's below size limit or above the bag limit and those those fish could potentially be intercepted by MREP. And so there's, you know, the question of for the recreational sector, how does it counted, get counted? Does it get intercepted? Is there a possibility for it or not? Um, and then, you know, are there other ways that you could define illegally harvested fish? Um, how does an illegal harvest count against a state's overall quota? Um, and does the same practice occur for both sectors? And then if illegal harvest is not being accounted for against a state's quota, does it get reported as landings for the stock assessment or not? Um, and these are some of the questions that I first started thinking about when, um, when Jason approached me on this subject. Um, and as I went forward, I saw that there's definitely not common practices across all the states. And oftentimes, some of the excessively large harvests, as Jay pointed out, um, are so far above a state's quota that in some cases a state wouldn't have any quota if they had to count it against their quota for years. Um, um, so the question to the policy board is, is there an interest in discussing some sort of standard practice for what could happen to illegal harvest um, moving forward? Okay, are there any questions on this? What does the board think? Is this something that uh, we should try to put together a, uh, a, a subcommittee to try and uh, bring back something? Mike? And thank you, Mr. Chair. And while I have the mic, let me explain that why I'm here, I guess. Um, most of you know Kelly Dennett was promoted and now is the chief of the Domestic Fisheries Division for the agency. 
I'm actually working out of Silver Spring for three months, backfilling for her. So most of you know me from Garfo, but I'm filling in in Kelly's old job, and they'll, they'll, whenever we have the hiring freeze lifted, hopefully be a permanent person that's here. But anyway, thanks for that. Uh, letting me go that aside. Uh, I, I really appreciate this being brought up. I do think it's something that we would be interested in trying to develop uh, collaboratively, particularly for the FMPs that we have state quotas. There's always this question of uh, how disposition of catch should be handled. I would encourage, um, if there is a working group, though, to coordinate through the Law Enforcement Committee and or NOAA's OLE, because I think um, there are often, you know, because of the judicial process, it's not always even clear when fish is illegal, because sometimes due process has to occur to make that determination. So that raises another series of questions as to what disposition of catch is if it has to be held for a while before decisions are made. But uh, I, I really appreciate this being brought up. and. I think that uh, having a standardized policy where it's possible would be uh, a benefit to us all. John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tony, was the consideration brought up that if it was to count against the quota, that it would almost be penalizing states for doing a good job of enforcement? <laughs> I think that's part of something that the, uh, you know, a subcommittee should discuss uh, and uh, have part of the discussion here. And some of my questions uh, for Tony and Jay is we've talked, uh, it was mentioned by Mike that we should include law enforcement uh, on this subcommittee. Uh, should we have this at the commission level or would something it say at the, the mid manager level like management and science committee be able to uh, address this <coughs> um, along with maybe a commissioner or two do we need stock assessment biologists on it or I don't know what level at, at your individual states who is the most informed of how these illegal harvests are being treated who knows that and who's who's the best person to talk about that issue and I don't know if it's your management and science person or not um, so that would be a, a question to the board um, I don't think we would need assessment science committee at least at the beginning I mean I think that in any assessment having the best understanding of what catches is the best for an assessment we know that up front so <clears throat> having a legal harvest that doesn't get reported in order and doesn't feed into assessment then just adds to the uncertainty surrounding that assessment so I think that that's pretty standard practice I don't know if Jay's about to okay I have a number of people I'll start with Jay and I'll start working around the board okay uh, you, you can go to the other folks Doug all right, all right then I'll go <laughs> go ahead Thanks, Doug. Um, I think you're going to find you're going to have a collection of stories that come out from every state, and there's going to be um, examples that are across the spectrum. So I think you need to inventory the states, um, and I think every state should probably have an opportunity to enter the conversation because, in some cases, the law enforcement officers are um, supervised by the state directors. In some cases, they're not. Um, and even within my state, Massachusetts, we've had some uh, really interesting cases of, um, of uh, illegal harvest where law enforcement did a great job. And in some cases, we, we did actually apply it to the quota because it was a dealer who was, you know, moving the fish to New York and it was in commerce and we shut the fishery down early and we also revoked his permit and he is not in the business anymore. So it's a case-by-case -case basis um, that I, I think is worthy of of discussion for sure, but I think each state needs to come forward and, and kind of share their experiences. Adam, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the sentiment of a working group. It certainly served us well in a number of areas. Uh, I'm not sure we can there's so many issues associated with this with, that I'm not sure it's going to inform us to come up with a bullet point of two or three very specific things what to do with it. Uh, when I think of a legal harvest, there's a number of areas of concern that we have with it. 
Obviously, one is just purely an accounting basis, um, and that's certainly, I think, something that maybe a working group could work on. How do we account for it in our year-end accounting? Uh, but there's a lot of other issues that I think are primarily state and species specific. I don't think there would be a one-size-fits-all policy, but I do think the one-size-fits-all policy we could consider as a group would be passing that along and ensuring it's in a term of reference in all of our stock assessments to ask that those stock assessments do um, if cannot directly account for it, provide some information that helps inform our actions about it. I think that would be a one-size-fits-all policy. Uh, again, there's species by species. The Tautog Board is taking this on with a unique way of trying to address it there. Uh, certainly a big issue. Uh, but uh, there's many facets of it. Again, stopping it accounting for it and then addressing it in stock assessments I think are three very different things um, and could potentially be dealt with three different ways. Richie. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, I kind of see this in two parts and, that, and the first would be to uh, get the information back from the states as to how the individual states are handling it now. And then the second part would be, what do we do with that? And, you know, and do we want to form policy or make any changes? So I would think staff might be the better way to go to collect that information and then maybe report back to, the, to this board and then this board can decide whether, you know, what the next step should be. <clears throat> Jason? I appreciate all, all the discussion. I, I think, um, you know, this is a good step forward. And I think um, just to tag on to what Richie was just saying, along with the different policies of what's happening in the states, trying to get at least, a, you know, the last year's magnitude uh, of some of the things. And I, that would be a useful exercise for the states, I think, to see where they have to go to get this information. My, my sense is, in some cases, uh, there's a solid number. We seize as many fish. We gave it to a, um, you know, a food pantry or something like that. In other cases, I think the fish just disappear off into the ether. And so getting a handle on that, I think, will be important as well. And then to jump on to um, the, the thought process that um, Adam was having, um, I, that's kind of like how I was thinking about it as well. This could end up being like another category. We have harvest, we have discards, and, and this could be like a third category, um, you know, from that high-level stock assessment view. So I, I think there are some things that we could do here to make sure we're accounting for them without being punitive or, or anything like that. Okay, um, is there any other discussion on this or questions? What I'm going to propose, uh, and I think it was a good suggestion, <clears throat> is that initially we um, poll the states to see how they are handling this um, uh, in their individual states at this particular point in time. Um, and then once we get that, um, information back we'll bring this that back in the form of I guess a white paper or just a report on that and then we'll talk about the best way to move forward and uh, having a discussion about um, how to account for the legal activities um, you know how it's accounted for in stock assessments um, 
see if there's some kind of standard way in which we want to move forward or whether it's something that we have to have uh, be nimble and, and be unique about yeah, depending on the circumstances. Uh, does that seem like an appropriate way forward from the board? Is, is there any objection to moving forward that way? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that discussion. Thank you for bringing it up, Jay. The next item on our agenda is uh, to discuss a possible policy implications of a safe harbor landing guidance document. And Jim Gilmore is going to lead this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and today, really, we'd just like to get uh, some dialogue going on this. Um, and I'll give you a little history of, of how we got to this point. Um, and over the last, I guess, couple of years, we've actually had two instances of a safe harbor issue. <coughs> if you go back to the first one, um, our policy at that point was really a judgment call based upon law enforcement and staff. And that one turned out to be a bit of a mess because, first off, there was a, uh, essentially a fisherman came in that we actually didn't believe had a safe harbor issue. But when he came in, um, law enforcement tried to deal with him. And then he essentially offloaded his fish and sold them before anything could be done. They ticketed him. Um, and um, the state that he was actually going to would not give a transfer. So we ended up having a, uh, the, the landings taken off of our quota. And then when they actually got to court, um, the uh, thing got thrown out because um, there was no written policy. So that first episode was not very um, productive for anyone. Um, so what we did is we've come up, and then uh, about a year ago, we came up with a written policy, which is in your briefing materials, which was a combination of law enforcement, us. We sat with industry and got some information about what conditions would um, be a, a, you know, a, an emergency at sea. Um, because we wanted to make sure that there was some measure that if we did get into a situation again, we could bring, at least bring that into, you know, court, whatever. Um, so the second time it happened, it actually, it worked pretty well. Um, the, um, it was documented it followed this guidance. Um, the law enforcement agreed it was a safe harbor issue. Um, the uh, recipient state, um, or the, I guess the, the state where the, the, um, the fishermen had a permit from was Virginia. Uh, Virginia very graciously agreed to do the transfer. Um, it was a it was a love fest. We got the uh, fisherman um, back. Um, you know, we got to sell his catch down in Virginia, so everything worked out very well. Um, however, it did raise a whole lot of questions because um, the entire thing was quite ad hoc. Um, there was several decisions that had to be made, not only in New York but the other states. So. Um, so what I wanted to do is just raise the question now, do we need something a little more formal than we have because it is involving multiple states? So what I'd like to do is I just have three questions to raise to consider. Um, so in the situation, and again, I'll just refer to the most recent one, you know, it appears that both states, do both states need to agree that a safe harbor condition exists? And if we have different uh, policy or guidance, whatever, that if they're not the same, we may not agree that safe harbor exists. Secondly, the quota transfer is pretty important with this whole thing. Um, and do we need something uh, more of a, not a formal agreement, but something more of a gentleman's agreement that there will be a, a transfer if indeed it is identified as a, a an actual safe harbor situation? And the last one, which we were struggling with in New York is if we do allow, say, a fisherman to land in New York that was supposed to go to Virginia, um, does he have to go back to, does he have to truck his, his, his fish back to Virginia or can he sell them locally? And that raised issues about interstate commerce or whatever. So those are the three questions that came up from this last episode. So I just wanted to put that out, have some discussion on it, and just see if they answer the question, do we need something a little more formal or, or a little bit more consistent among the states um, under our, our safe harbor concerns? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I totally agree 
uh, with Jim that I think it, it would be desirable to have a, a kind of a generic policy that all of the states could use. And I just point out that I attended the last, um, at, at our last meeting, I attended the enforcement uh, session where this was discussed. And I mean, there were a lot of good ideas that came out of the enforcement committee at that meeting. I don't know whether there's a written record of it or not, but uh, I, I think it would be really useful to, um, to have a, a, a generic policy that all of the states could follow. Um, and uh, I think uh, the other suggestion is I think we should seek the guidance of our enforcement committee on some of the provisions of it. So I, I totally agree with the need for this. Thank you. Robert, Rob. Both apply. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I don't know whether we're a model, but we've been uh, having this uh, policy for quite some time. And it starts out that the um, state whose vessel it is, uh, the state personnel contact us in Virginia and request safe harbor. Um, as soon as that's approved by the commissioner of the agency, then law enforcement is notified so they know that there's a vessel that's under safe harbor because there's no offloading whatsoever. A subsequent um, contact from the state whose vessel it is will often say probably, I'd say 85% of the time, 90% of the time, that there's also a request to offload because the vessel is severely impaired, um, the fish may spoil, you know, that type of an approach. And then that goes through the same situation where um, when it's in our state where law enforcement is notified. The commissioner has approved. Everyone's notified. The, the buyer is notified in Virginia, North Carolina. In, in this case, has had several of these, but also New York, Massachusetts, other states. And it seems to work just fine because everyone is aware of, of what's occurring. Um, we haven't really been in a situation where we've doubted Safe Harbor, but we did have an occasion where someone, where for a little while when this was early on in the, in the process, so you know probably the early 2000s, um, where we had a vessel who just automatically assumed that he could have safe, the vessel could have Safe Harbor. And of course that was quickly approached by law enforcement and got straightened out. As far as the um, interstate commerce, I wasn't quite sure how that works because it would be expected that with, when you transfer the quota, then it belongs to the state it's transferred to. So if a New Jersey vessel uh, seeks safe harbor in Virginia, and then subsequently there's a request from the state of New Jersey to have the offloading, um, there's a transfer of quota that's set in order, and you know, that quota is now Virginia quota, essentially. Um, and it works the other way around as well in the case of what uh, Jim was saying. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I definitely appreciate um, Jim's work in putting this together. And, you know, as Rob's alluded to, this is certainly reflective of many of the elements that have developed over the years between Virginia and North Carolina in terms of quota transfers with regard to, um, you know, contacting the agency to obtain permission to offload, um, you know, fish in another state and sending us required documentation. Um, you know, we require a, a Coast Guard Marine Casualty form and information from a mechanic or someone just to make sure that, you know, this is, we're, we're granting this because there's really a need to do so. Um, and definitely like the definitions of the different types of reasons for which um, you know, quota transfer might be allowed to occur or, you know, reasons for, for doing so, the definition of the declared circumstances, I guess. And I was just curious, you know, Jim, if you guys uh, worked with industry at all and, you know, developing some of these things. I know that we had a lot of conversation back and forth with industry when we were trying to put something down on paper you know, when we were having some, 
you know, frequent transfers of summer flounder quota to Virginia. Um, so that, that's just one question. Um, and then I think the other question I have is the, the weather condition criteria. And I'm just wondering, you know, if, if you've applied that at all before in terms of forecasted weather conditions and how far out, you know, you allow for that. I mean, if, you know, everybody looks at the forecast and presumably captains are doing the same thing to, you know, determine their sail plan. So I was just curious about that as well. And then I guess the only other thing I'll add to with regard to what Rob said was that, um, you know, when we've transferred quota to Virginia to um, cover some of these safe harbor issues in the past, I mean, the Virginia dealers have sold, have sold those fish, so I'm not aware I wouldn't have, I don't think it ever crossed our minds to require that fish be, you know, trucked back to the state. It becomes, uh, you know, that the, the receiving state's quota, I guess. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jim? Yeah, Michelle, the, um, first off, we, we had uh, two um, meetings, uh, sessions with the commercial fishermen to get their input. And then after we developed the draft on this, we gave it back to them and actually Part of the reason to your second question was really the weather part of it was a little bit more difficult to capture. And it, and it actually turns out that the, um, the first episode where we kind of got, um, we didn't have a good outcome to it was uh, the weather conditions actually weren't that bad. And um, actually there was a federal observer on board too. And uh, so, you know, the, we, we felt that that was uh, probably a good example to set where, where maybe the limit was. But again, we've got most of, that information for both weather and the conditions came from the fishermen, at least in consultation with them. Um, the weather part of it is difficult because, um, you know, it's you know, one, one man's uh, storm is another man's regular day out at sea. So, again, we, we deferred mostly to the industry to let them define that. And, of course, it's obviously subject to, you know, change if somebody thinks that would be, you know, uh, it's too restrictive or it should be more restrictive. But, again, that's uh, something we felt was appropriate, and it worked pretty well the one time we've used it so far. Thanks. Dan? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, we have in Massachusetts have had a number of cases where there's been um, vessel breakdown or, or injury to crew or captain, and we've worked with North Carolina and, and Virginia, and we've supplied the Coast Guard or required a Coast Guard report, et cetera. Um, about the incident, and, and as a result, they've transferred the quota to us um, as, they, as they could. Um, but I just want to point out that at the law enforcement subcommittee meeting, uh, the most recent one, they pointed out to us that technically safe harbor means, yeah, come on in because it's rough out, uh, but you're still going to leave with the fish. So, for example, in January in Massachusetts, <clears throat> our fluke limit is, is uh, zero. So if someone's fluke fishing and it's, and it's rough, they can have safe harbor. They can bring it into a port, but they call ahead. They can't unload it. So really what we're talking about is unloading fish uh, in a state for which the, 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 the amount should be attributed to another state. But the true safe harbor policies are, yeah, come on in, and, and, but you've got to take your fish with you when you leave. Steve Train. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to avoid entering this debate, but there was something that made me a little bit nervous, and that would be a policy where somebody ashore would tell a captain whether it was too rough to come in or not. And I, I mean, as, as we just stated earlier, it's pretty hard to say uh, whether you thought it was bad weather or not. But if the captain of the vessel doesn't believe he belongs out in it, it's unsafe weather, and that shouldn't be determined by someone on land, ever. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and that speaks to another question I had forgotten to ask Jim. I didn't know when you guys were talking about the, the, the weather situation, whether or not there had been any conversation with the Coast Guard about, you know, criteria for weather. I, I think Dan touched on a really important point in that safe, Safe Harbor is a tool that is always available, and what we're trying to address here is um, conditions under which, you know, transfer of quota would be allowed to another state. So, you know, hopefully that gives Steve a little bit of 
of ease, but I was just curious if there had been any conversations with the Coast Guard in terms of weather. Jim? Yeah, my understanding, our law enforcement guys dealt with the Coast Guard to discuss part of that, to find the weather condition. And to Steve's point, um, we actually talked about that, Steve, and we were trying to say not to, like, maybe give a criteria or take that away from the cap. And it was to give them guidance that if you're coming in, um, you know, if you're, if all these conditions are met, you're probably going to be able to offload and do everything else. If it's not, but you still feel it's unsafe, it's just that you may not be able to transfer and get all the, you know, economic benefits of it. But, you know, again, you're right. It's not designed to usurp the uh, authority of the captain in terms of a safe condition at sea. Further discussion? Jim, would you like to uh, lead a subcommittee on this where you would coordinate also with law enforcement uh, to develop a draft policy? It was the reason I almost didn't put this on because I figured it was going to get to that. But <laughs> yes, I will do that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this point, are there other uh, commissioners that would like to be on this? Dave Borden, uh, Dan McKiernan, Russ. Michelle, I think that's a good subcommittee. Okay, thank you for bringing that up, Jim. I think it's an important topic that I think we should uh, uh, see if we can de develop a draft policy. And uh, uh, I assume you would be reporting back to the board uh, either in May or, or sometime during the summer, depending on how long you work. Okay. Okay, next item on the agenda is an update on the climate change working group. Uh, last spring, uh, I, I uh, asked for volunteers for a working group to develop uh, policy, science policy and management strategies to assist the commission with adopting its management, uh, ad adapting its management, not adopting, adapting its management change to changes in species abundance and distribution resulting from a climate change uh, impacts. Uh, we have had a uh, uh, conference call last fall and just before this meeting we uh, had a face-to-face -face meeting. We had a very productive meeting. We are in the process of trying to develop uh, a white paper uh, with policies that the ISFMP board would uh, be able to look at and consider whether they would like to move forward with implementing those policies. We're still in the process of putting that together. Uh, we anticipate that we'll have at least one more meeting uh, prior to our spring meeting and then uh, possibly have something for you all to look at by the summer meeting. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we're moving right along here. Uh, Ashton, uh, we have a couple of coastal sharks update, and uh, just so that folks are aware, one of these is going to require final action and a motion. So for those of you who are on the coastal sharks board, uh, I appreciate your help in, in moving this motion forward. And just so everybody knows, the reason why this is on policy board and not a coastal sharks board is the um, final action from highly migratory species didn't occur until after we had um, set the schedule. Okay, thank you, Tony. So I would just like to make the board aware of a new black nose possession limit. Uh, so last year, NOAA Fisheries published a final rule establishing a commercial retention limit of eight black nose sharks for all limited access permit holders in the Atlantic region south of 34 degrees north latitude, and this was effective January 13th of 2017. So previously, there was no possession limit for black nose sharks. Um, as specified in Addendum 2 to the Coastal Sharks FMP, the board can set possession limits for the harvest of black nose sharks in state waters. So should the board choose to complement the federal management measures, action will need to be taken by the policy board at this meeting. Um, as far as justification uh, for moving this uh, public rule forward, or final rule forward, is that the commercial retention limit was implemented because the black nose and small coastal shark quotas are linked. 
So meaning if one were to exceed 80%, then both of the fisheries will close. Uh, and this happened about five months into the 2016 fishing season. So the black nose quota was expected to exceed 80%. So both the black nose and the small coastal shark um, fisheries closed. Um, this action is expected to increase the utilization of available non-black nose small coastal shark quota and aid in the rebuilding and end overfishing for Atlantic black nose sharks. And with that, I'll take questions. Questions for Ashton. Seeing none, is there uh, someone that would like to uh, make a motion here? Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I might need a little bit of help from staff in terms of wordsmithing the motion, but um, I would move that we complement the federal management measures with regard to the black nose possession limit south of the 34 latitude line. Is there a second? Uh, Pat Gear. Robert Boyle's discussion on the motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question for clarification, maybe to Jim and to Pat. Um, many of you may know that in South Carolina we automatically track federal regulations for sharks. Um, I note 34 degrees north is roughly Cape Fear, I believe. So my question to Pat and to Jim is, um, I'm not quite sure what effect this will have because I, I think we're already there. Um, just a question for Jim and Pat, um, how Florida, how this will affect Florida and Georgia. Jim? We really don't have a commercial fishery for sharks in the state waters because we have a possession limit of one. Same with us, we don't have commercial fishery for sharks. <clears throat> Further discussion on this motion? Michelle? So I'm gonna put on my South Atlantic hat a little bit here, but um, <clears throat> we had had concerned uh, fishermen who are actually fishing in federal waters off of Florida come before um, the council and request a little bit of relief. These are folks who I believe were fishing in the, the Spanish mackerel gillnet fishery and were, but they're also permitted shark fishermen, federally permitted shark fishermen. They were encountering uh, um, uh, small coastals. However, they were having to throw those fish back because of this linked quota that Ashton has mentioned. So, well, there was actually a lot of quota left on the table for small coastal sharks who were having to discard those fish that they were encountering incidental to their Spanish mackerel um, harvesting activities dead and so <clears throat> um, you know we we brought this before the HMS advisory panel and, and brought it to the HMS division and this was actu actually implementing a trip limit on um, the the black nose was a way to get at that rather than I think what we had talked about was having some incidental catch limit of the small coastals when there was quota left on the table, you know, in these other fisheries. And so this was actually the way that HMS suggested solving it. And so, um, you know, certainly we supported that and recognized that, you know, there's not necessarily state waters fisheries for sharks and South Carolina automatically complements that, I think, um, for for consistency with the plan and based on um, the concerns of fishermen with regard to uh, dead discards, you know, I would recommend supporting this. Further discussion on the motion? This is a final action. Uh, I'm going to try first to see if there is a consensus here. Is there any objection to this motion? Any abstentions? Terry? The state of Maine, excuse me. And PRFC? Okay, it passes by nearly unanimous uh, consent with two abstentions.
Ashton. Okay, so the, the next um, item is no immediate action is required. It's more of kind of a notice to the board. Uh, so the National Marine Fisheries Service um, released a proposed a threatened listing for oceanic white tip sharks. And this was based on um, the best scientific and commercial information available. They pre uh, published a status review report that was released in 2016 after taking into account efforts that were made to protect the species. The National Marine Fisheries Service has determined that the oceanic white tip shark warrants listing as a threatened species and concludes that the, the shark is likely to become endangered throughout all or a significant portion of its range within the foreseeable future. At this time, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service is requesting public comment. So all comments are to be received by March 29th of 2017. If a state would like a public hearing, they would need to be notified by February 13th of 2017. Um, in regard to the comments, they're looking for some pretty specific things in general. Um, they would like to have comments on new or updated information regarding the range, distri distribution, abundance, population structure, or genetics of oceanic white tip sharks, as well as their habitat. Any new um, biological data that would concern any threats to the species, such as post-release mortality rates, finning rates in commercial fisheries, etc. Um, they're also interested in current or planned activities within its range and their possible impacts on the species, uh, recent observation or samples of oceanic white tip sharks, and lastly, efforts that are being made to protect oceanic white tip sharks. And comments can be submitted uh, via mail or electronic submission, and these are all the places to submit the comments are in the proposed rule on the Federal Register. With that, I'll take questions. Any questions for Ashton on this? Seeing none, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, we're now down to uh, other business. Uh, the first item of other business I have here is a motion from the herring section. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Atlantic herring section is in the process of an addendum um, that will put more tools in the toolbox for the section to uh, be able to slow the harvest down uh, during trimester two in area 1A, and to do that we need uh, real-time harvest data. So, uh, so on behalf of the Atlantic Herring Section, move that the Commission write a letter to the GARFO office requesting that the states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts be granted access to the VMS pre-landing report. It's a motion from the committee. It doesn't need a second. Um, any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, is there any? Oh, yes, Mike. Sorry, I wasn't quick with my hand there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out for the benefit of the board that, as was discussed in the hearing section, this letter likely will end up with our Office of Law Enforcement as they're the, the group that actually controls access to VMS landing. Regardless of who you send it to, we'll make sure it gets to them. But uh, there is a, a, an extensive process to get vetted for VMS data. Thanks. Okay, given that, uh, oh, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like that the motion be refined to reflect the area of fish, which we're talking about 1A, I believe. So that these three states would only have access to uh, herring <coughs> pre-trip notification VMS data for herring 1A. Okay. Um, Is this uh, just do you are you you're making a motion or I suppose it's a motion to amend but I'd rather have it as a friendly effort I just don't think they need access to area two okay um, 
Hmm. I, I, the, the difficult part that I see with a, a friendly is this is a motion from the committee. So it's not like you're asking the seconder, uh, the maker and seconder to do this. Richie, would you like to speak to it? Thank you. Yeah, I'd agree that the, the uh, section voted this motion in. So uh, I think I don't think I I have the ability to change that. And I guess I don't understand the problem with those states seeing that information <clears throat> during that time period because it's it's the summer and I don't know that there's a lot of harvest going on in area two during the summer. But um, so I guess you'd have to make the motion to amend if if you're concerned about it. But I guess I don't understand the concern. Eric? Uh, okay. I, I understand the intent of the motion. I just, you know, you could get inundated with, uh, with landings reports. I'm assuming that you would request specific landing reports from specific vessels or specific areas, and that'll be okay with me. I just, you know. There's no reason you have access to all of them. And I should have made the, the comment at the, at the hearing board, but I did not. So it's my, my bad, and forget it. Richie? Well, the intent of the motion is to get data and use data for harvesting in Area 1A during the second trimester. So I don't know if that helps you or not, but that, that was the the reasoning behind the motion. <laughs> Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Due to the marvels of technology, I've been corresponding with staff during this conversation, and um, uh, they very specifically request this data. They want to know who is fishing where right now. Uh, we have all the areas, but now as a state. so. Um, our technical staff, please, will be able to provide us better information if they have uh, broader access to the data. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to Eric's concerns about being inundated, uh, I believe once access is granted, it's typically the entire VMS suite for the Northeast. However, you can create custom reports that would allow you to select uh, I, I'm sure Area 1A is one that's selectable, uh, specific vessels by registration. So there's ways to call the data down so that you don't have to look at all the tracks that are out there for everything along the Atlantic seaboard. And just so we're clear, we're, we're not going to be even requesting the tracks. We're asking for the pre-trip -notif notification uh, data specifically. Correct. But I, I think the process of getting access may involve getting clearance to be able to see it all. What you want out of it, you can choose. But I think that's why I said it's best to go through OLE, because they'll have to vet through some process who gets the data and who will have control of it. OK, further discussion on this motion. Um, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes by unanimous consent. Uh, next other business I have is Shanna, uh, who is going to uh, give us an update on the risk and uncertainty workshop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so if the policy board will remember, back at annual meeting last year, um, Jason reported out to the group um, a quick example of what our risk and uncertainty policy might look like and we suggested to the board that we move ahead with developing a more solid example um, and the board recommended that we do uh, striped bass and so the workshop would sort of focus on moving striped bass through this test uh, risk and uncertainty policy um, and we had discussed uh, holding this workshop in May um, we would like to request from the board that we move the workshop back to either August or this annual meeting 
uh, meeting week um, simply because we have a lot of overlap um, amongst a lot of our committee members. There's a lot of meetings going on earlier this year and the group would like to have the chance to um, take the work group's report to the assessment science and management science committee and fully vet it through those two groups before bringing it to the policy board to make sure that we have a more solid example to bring to the group. Um, so essentially we just would like to know if it's okay if we kind of bump that workshop back from May meeting week to later on this year, uh, depending on what space is available for us. Any questions? Any objection to this request? I think we're okay with it. Thank you very much. Uh, final uh, other business item, Adam. You wanted to bring uh, an issue, of, uh, a discussion about the summer flounder assessment. Great, thank you. I'll try to do this with as little feedback as possible, although we seem to be all fighting the common enemy at this point. Uh, so this is a motion that came from the summer flounder block sea bass and scup board at the December joint meeting with the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, and the motion at that time was to have the policy board request that the NRCC get a summer flounder assessment on the schedule as soon as possible. Uh, Dr. Sul Pat Sullivan from Cornell has been doing work, uh, working with the Science Center and a number of other groups uh, on developing a sex-based model. Uh, he's now presented twice to the Mid-Atlantic Council, uh, most recently at the joint meeting in December, so those members of the board that were there at the time got to see that presentation. Uh, this is the recommendation from the last stock assessment uh, peer review that that species move towards summer flounder, move towards a sex-based model. Uh, and Dr. Sullivan's work has now brought us to that point. Uh, he's ready to go with it. So the issue has become one of timing, uh, specifically with the recreational re-estimations re that are taking place in trying not to duplicate the stock assessment process, uh, but at the same time not wanting to delay the use of what would be the best available science for summer flounder any longer than absolutely necessary. Uh, so there's been concerns about trying to get it on the schedule. Uh, I would ask at this point, we've had some conversations with staff. Uh, they have discussed the need to go through the assessment science committee before asking specifically the NRCC to put this on the schedule ASAP. The first available time frame that we've been told to go through the Science Center would be the second half of 2018, would be the first available time frame. Discussions tomorrow are going to certainly let us know that that may be too little too late for a lot of people involved. So I would first ask one uh, to get some feedback from staff regarding that process of getting that request through the NRCC and then two I'd like to turn to our, I'll turn to Russ uh, who's got some information about New Jersey's willingness to look at funding this assessment potentially outside of the typical saw sark process. I'll go to Tony first and then to Russ or uh, staff. Bob. Bob. Right, I'm awake now, Doug. <clears throat> um, just a quick comment on the NRCC, Northeast Region Coordinating Council. It's a group made up of the Commission, Mid-Atlantic, New England Councils, uh, the, the uh, Regional Office, GARFO, and the Science Center. And, and the five bodies get together and try to try to figure out how to populate the SAUSAR schedule given everyone's com uh, competing demands for assessment time and the limited resources that, that Woods Hole has. Um, <clears throat> you know, we can, we can bring that forward. It's a high priority or, or you know, um, I attend all those meetings and we, we kind of do a lot of horse trading and, and try to, you know, make the case for what species are the highest priority and, and should be put on the soft schedule. So, <clears throat> you know, bringing that forward is, 
that's easy and, and we can do that. You know, that doesn't guarantee results. Um, you know, we, I've been trying to get straight bass on that schedule for quite a while and haven't, haven't been successful. So we we're having to do that in other, uh, through the commission, solely through the commission process. So, um, you know, the, the mid Atlantic counts for, for species like summer flounder, scut, black sea bass, bluefish, the jointly managed species, we can work with the mid Atlantic council. And if they see it as a priority as well, at least you've got two groups pulling in the same direction. So, um, you know, we can, we can bring that forward. It doesn't guarantee results. Um, there are, the saw sark schedule is pretty full with um, a number of ground fish species that, that uh, New England Council needs, you know, additional assessments on so they can move forward with their management. The, there's a big chunk of time set aside to deal with the recreational data that's coming online, the transition from the mail survey to the phone, or from phone survey to the mail survey, um, which has a potential to significantly impact the number of assessments. So the 2017-2018 the schedule is pretty full. Um, but we can we can bring that you know summer flounder forward and see what see what we can do. Russ, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, as Adam said, this is something that we think, and I'm sure many other states think, is the priority uh, to get an assessment done. We know there's better data out there. We need to move forward. So we're kind of looking at it as a, a process that maybe we're not going through Saul Sark. And I don't know how um, that process goes. I know it's been done before with other species where it's been independently funded to do that. As of now, we have, we've already found a, a $40,000 to start this process. We're looking for additional funding. We're talking to our recreational uh, community trying to get some additional money there and then I think we'll be talking to other states to put some other money together in order to go outside of that Saul Sark process and get this stock assessment done but I can guarantee that that money is only available for 2017 it won't be available down the road we're looking forward to other states jumping on board and, and trying to get this done so you know Mid Atlantic Council meets in a couple weeks I, I think if if this Commission can say this is the way we want to go I think we can bring that back up to Mid-Atlantic Council, maybe get everybody on board and find a way to get that assessment done because I think it's critical, especially for New Jersey, but also for New York and all the other states that are involved here. So thank you. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a follow-up to Bob um, and, and as someone who's been to a number of NRCC meetings, I do want to advise the uh, board here of a really overfilled um, uh, stock assessment schedule for the next two years. Um, it's committed this year for 2017. Uh, 2018, um, at this point, is, is the saw socks are committed to scallops, herring, shad, and the second half of the year is, is fully dedicated to MREP. Um, but uh, one thing the New England Council did uh, to address an issue with Atlantic halibut was to seek an outside um, uh, source. And the New England Council's funded an alternative uh, assessment, and, and, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that offline. Further discussion on this? Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We did get a little bit of a heads up about that this might come up today and you know the issue of trying to advance the schedule for summer flounder has been broadly discussed um, and you know I, I understand the and appreciate the desire to have that advanced on the schedule and I won't repeat all the comments that have already been made about what's already prescribed the NRCC process the other uh, discussion that's come up about MREP transition I think those are all valid points but at the same time that is not wholly satisfactory to people and, and I get that there's, there, there is a challenge for us, I think, in the potential for competing science. Um, you know, we are very aware of Dr. Sullivan's work. We have collaborated with him. We've been encourage his, uh, encouraging his work on this sex-based model. Um, we do think and hope that it holds promise for incorporation into a, a full assessment. And so one of the things that might be worth consideration is to um, try to have that work independently evaluated and reviewed if there's funds that are available to do that. Um, but the, the issue then becomes, you know, the agency is, for better or for worse, the arbiter of what constitutes best available science when it's applied. So we would need to be able to vet that information. And so going through a formal process um, with that assessment 
type and having it externally peer-reviewed might give us the opportunity to do that. Of course, it all remains to be seen. Peer reviews are not a foregone conclusion that models are upheld or the suggestions or outputs that are derived from them are always recommended for management use. But that might help accelerate the schedule for a time when it could be incorporated into the SOSARC schedule if it's already kind of gone through a, and been vetted through a peer review. Um, you know, obviously, if the, me uh, the methods in the model diverge significantly from the advice that is already coming out of the, the peer-reviewed model at SOSARC, we'd have some questions that we'd need to talk about then and try to figure out how to move forward. But, you know, I think we, we can be supportive in the ways that we have been. As I mentioned, we've been trying to work with Dr. Sullivan. He's been very collaborative with us. So it's not a completely independent evaluation being conducted outside the purview uh, in total of, of the agency. Um, but as far as scheduling it through our existing SOS ARC process and then having you know, the Center of Independent Experts, as, as has been mentioned, the, the schedule is full. Um, there is another planned update for summer flounder uh, this summer, which will update the independent and fishery dependent data sources, but that is as people will rightly point out, simply an update to the existing methods and model. So there, there might be ways to work with this, and if it's something that people are, are trying to put together, I'd encourage them to reach out to John here and the staff at the center and to try to find ways for collaboration and to make sure that whatever happens ends up to be well-suited for either consideration moving forward into a larger assessment process or to help inform management advice. The, the one thing, and I, and I don't think this is what people suggest, is we don't want you know, rogue science popping up everywhere. And I don't think that's at all what's suggested, but that's, that's something that we have to think about in terms of when management recommendations come to us, we have to vet what scientific basis they're founded on as part of National Standard 2. <coughs> and so we have to be able to verify the information there. And, and Dr. Sullivan's been very forthright and shared his results with us to date, but peer review would be an important part of that as well. Michelle and then Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just, just to sort of speak briefly on what Mike offered in terms of um, a, a different peer review process or an external peer review process, we've <clears throat> experienced similar um, Similar difficulties, I think, on the South Atlantic with uh, the resources available for uh, stock assessments and updates. You know, particularly if something urgent comes forward, and I'll note that our SSC for the South Atlantic Council actually developed a, a procedure for what we call third-party assessments. So, um, developed a very uh, prescribed process whereby the SSC has review over um, a third party assessment from the beginning. Now this has only been applied once to our to a wreckfish assessment um, that I believe was conducted by Dr. Butterworth a couple of years ago. So I know John Carmichael, who is the CDAR program manager, is going to be here, I believe, probably later on today, certainly tomorrow, for the South Atlantic Board. So I would encourage folks who are interested in something like that to reach out to John. He can give you a little bit more of the specifics and provide the documentation that the South Atlantic Council SSC put together to try to address these things. So thank you. Rob? I was just going to say that uh, with joint management, it, it sort of makes it difficult to um, hear Russ, uh, and I count that as enthusiasm on the part of New Jersey to take a step forward as quickly as possible. But, you know, I'm certainly well aware that in joint management, the partners all have to be, uh, you know, sort of holding hands. And so I guess at the next council meeting, there needs to be something said about what was done here today. I know at the last council meeting um, there was, you know, pretty definite ideas that the assessment had to wait at least until after the MRIP situation was settled, and that did not sit well with some of the board members uh, in that joint meeting, and so you're seeing a little overflow of that today. So I think the conversations still have to happen between the ASMFC and the Mid-Atlantic Council, um, but certainly there probably are reasons um, why New Jersey needs to know what it's going to do next as far as, you know, making that kind of investment. Over the course of doing stock assessments, 
You know, the first stock assessment I remember was Gary Shepard with Striped Bass in 1996. That was VPA. After that, the state personnel were doing the stock assessments. And I always thought, really, ASMFC needs to do those assessments, and that's what's happened. You know, we've modernized. ASMFC has staff that does the assessments, but we're in a joint situation, and, uh, you know, there is there are differences. So, um, you know, let's go forward back to the council and see what the thought pattern is there. Um, and I certainly appreciate the comments of New Jersey. Adam? So I think at a bare minimum today, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to know uh, if this policy board does need to act on that motion that came out of the Summer Flounder, Black Sea Bass, and Scup board at the joint meeting, uh, and if so, it would be appropriate to take action on that. Um, and at a bare minimum, certainly have other states begin consulting with New Jersey about the possibility of finding a way, working with the service, as Mike said. Dr. Hare has been an integral part of the conversation in recent months as well about trying to find a way to get this done for potential management use in 2018. I think that behooves everyone around the table, certainly the board members, this commission as a whole, the council, the service, the fishermen, and probably most importantly, the resource that we are here to represent. Further discussion? So we have a question, do we need to, uh, uh, what, is there anything this policy board needs to do to move the motion that was at the Black uh, sea, Fluke Plastic Sea Bass and Scup Board in December uh, forward for action here? Tony? I mean, in particular to the motion itself of taking it to the NRCC, we can, you know, Bob indicated that he can do that at the June spring meeting, which I believe is in June this year. Um, whether or not that gets on the NRCC in 2017, as Terry indicated, the schedule is already full, so that would be highly, I think, highly unlikely. But again, I can't predict what would happen there. Um, and it's it's not on the SARC schedule until 2019 right now. You've indicated that you've gotten some information that it might be able to fit into the fall of 2018. So that's information that I didn't have prior to. So. Beyond taking it to the NRCC, we can definitely do that. Em Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so it seems that we're not going to need a, a motion then to forward this or to have Bob bring it to the um, NRCC. Um, so I, I suggest that we move forward with that. Um, I, I think it's important that we have an, um, a benchmark assessment for summer flounder occur as soon as possible. You know, we've been managing this resource for, what, 20 or 25 years? And we're going to have quite a discussion tomorrow morning um, relative to where we are and where we need to go and, and, and what our regulations should be for summer flounder. And, and here we are 20 years later, we're not better off than we were when we started this. In fact, some may think that we're in, in, in worse shape than when we started this. And, and our last assessment update um, said that we've been um, overfishing since uh, 1980. Um, so we need, we need to do something different here for some of them. And I think a sex-based benchmark assessment is the start of doing something different. Because what we've been doing all along here doesn't seem to be working. So I think we need to move this process forward. Um, if the NRCC is going to meet in June, I, I think it was mentioned, then we'll have, we'll have an answer then. In the meantime, perhaps we can work with New Jersey about um, raising some additional funds to pay for an assessment outside the, 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 the saw SARC process and start to have some conversations with people about how that needs to go forward. 
And one question that I have relative to that, if it does go forward outside the the uh, um, the SARC process, can can the results of an outside conducted assessment be brought into the SARC component for a uh, final peer review? Um, you know that may be a way to uh, to incorporate this as well and and get the proper. Or, or to get a peer review that, that NIMS is, is comfortable with. Thank you. Does anybody at the service feel comfortable in ask, answering that question at this point, Mike? Well, actually, no, I'm not comfortable answering that because I don't know what the answer to that would be. But I would think that that should be included within the conversation um, with both the Northeast Science Center and then potentially the NRCC. Um, I think those are the, the best avenues to, to get a definitive answer on something like that. Adam? I'll just add I've had conversations building on Terry's comments with the New England Council about that Atlantic halibut work and that road that Emerson just suggested is my understanding of exactly what the intention is. Have Dr. Rago do the modeling, everything that would go through up to that point and then have it go through the shark process for peer review. That, that's my understanding of what the intent is with the halibut work. Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, thankfully, uh, New Hampshire does not have summer flounder. Um, but I just have a question on process. Wouldn't the process be that the Summer Flounder Board makes a motion and passes it, and then it's on the agenda here with the chair of the board. I guess I don't, I'm not quite understanding how, why it's not going that route. Are you talking about the process of, of, of potentially funding another assessment, having uh, the state of New Jersey and potential other states uh, uh, providing funds for a, a peer-reviewed, not only the development of the stock assessment, but also the uh, external peer review would be paid for by that group. And I would assume, that, and I could be wrong, and I'll, I'll, uh, that the best mechanism to do that would be to funnel the funds through ASMSC and let them uh, develop the peer review process, get the peer review panel together, um, and actually try and, uh, in, in addition to try and move forward a, 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 a expedited stock assessment using the new model by uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, the, to the point of having an external party doing the the assessment work and then turning it over to SARC. I think we've raised that for species like northern shrimp and striped bass in the past, and it's still we still run into the same scheduling bottlenecks with the saw SARC process. So I'm not sure that one necessarily gets us out of the woods. But but what you suggested, Doug, of, of ASMFC pulling together a number of external uh, peer reviewers, we can do that. You know, we've done that for a number of species. We do that. We do that. You know, two, three, four times a year. And we can, you know, if there are funds available, we can work to find independent external reviewers that can uh, review assessment work either done by, you know, ASMSC groups or external groups if that's what, you know, the will of the board. So I think the, the saw SARC schedule is, is full. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'd be surprised if we can get, get our foot in the door to get much on that schedule through the end of 2018. Adam. So I'm not sure if I like where that recent conversation was going. I'm not sure where if Rick, if that answered Richie's question because I'm not sure if he was referring to the motion that came out of the Summer Flounder Board and why that wasn't presented by the chair here. I'd have to leave that to staff to say why that wasn't included as an option originally as part of the policy board. Uh, but I'll build on that and with. Bob's comments, so would this be recommended as an, I mean, I know we're already going to be crushed for time tomorrow morning, 
but is this what would be recommended as a discussion that needs to come out of that board tomorrow, potentially looking to find funds for external review through ASMFC to get this done sooner, or have we kind of short-circuited that saying that that was initiated by that board by requesting the stock assessment. Uh, how would we move forward with what Bob just described in as expeditious time frame as possible? Bob? It's really the, the comfort level of this board. You know, all the summer flounder folks are around the table right now. Tomorrow morning we're going to be, you know, as you said, crushed, if not worse, for time. Um, you know, if folks around the table here are comfortable proposing that we move forward with an external peer review through the ASMFC process of some sort, um, you know, I think I think that needs to be coordinated with the Mid-Atlantic Council in two weeks when we're down in, in uh, Kitty Hawk at the joint meeting to make sure that they're comfortable with that as well. Because I think if we end up in a situation where ASMFC does an assessment or, or you know, the states through ASMFC do an assessment and then the Mid-Atlantic's not comfortable with that course or doesn't, give an indication they're going to buy into the results of that process, we, we're going to end up in, a, in an awkward spot. So I think getting, you know, if this board, express, if the policy board expressed their comfort with moving down that road, and then we talk with the council about it in two weeks, I think that's probably the next, you know, the next two steps in my mind anyway. And as I understand it, that would take a motion by this board to move down that and also uh, by doing that, it would provide other states the opportunity to weigh in to see if they can uh, uh, provide additional funds to help support this. Because as I understand, this may cost more than the very generous amount that, that the state of New Jersey is willing to put forward. Uh, I will give... Uh, uh, John, first crack at this because he hadn't spoken first, but then uh, Adam, I'll take you afterwards. So, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm all for prioritizing a benchmark or even an external peer review, and Emerson's comments are, are well taken, but what I'm not entirely clear on are what are the expectations for this sex-based model? I mean, the surveys are the surveys. We're still going to have poor recruitment. And we're still going to have MRIP problems. So, uh, you know, is it is it worth it? And is it worth having the state of New Jersey dump this money in when we really? I'm not clear on what the expectations are. Emerson, but or do you want to address that uh, first, Adam? That question, or or do you want me to go to Emerson? I'll let Emerson go first. Okay, Emerson. Well, I, I, don't, I, I can't speak as to what everybody's expectations might be, uh, but my expectation would be um, an assessment that reflects the biology of the resource um, better than the current assessment. Summer flounder, males and females, grow at significantly different rates, and they have significantly different natural mortality rates. That's not taken into account in the current assessment. It's, 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 a, it's a, a, a blended natural mortality rate, if you will. So um, I would expect that um, an, a sex-based assessment will be more reflective of the biology of the resource. Um, I don't have expectations in terms of what the output is going to be. You know, the results of that assessment are going to be what they are. Uh, they may reaffirm where we are. They may come up with something different. Um, uh, they may provide less uncertainty in the output of the, uh, of the assessment. So th those are my thoughts on it. I don't know if anybody else has additional thoughts. Adam? So I'm glad I let Emerson go first because he clearly exemplified his better knowledge of that than I have. Uh, I, too, can offer, however, that I don't have any insight as to what the model will output. Uh, however, my expectation 
is that it will fulfill the recommendation from the last stock assessment for better science to move towards a stock, to move towards a model that is sex-based. And if that's what we take as best available science and we strive to meet those recommendations that come out of our peer-reviewed stock assessments, and here it is, somebody's holding it out there right in front of us. The apple's dangling. All we have to do is pull it down from the tree. It's there. We'd be remiss to not take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and to build on that, I would go ahead and make that motion. Uh, I'll probably need some help from staff here, but I would move that the ASMFC begin looking at working at fund at working at look at an external assessment for summer flounder for 2018 management use and I'll start there look for a second and take whatever help staff can give us given this this the uh, discussion uh, would it be appropriate to say to any external peer-reviewed assessment that's a question to Adam. Um, are you looking for the commission to conduct that external peer review or external assessment as well as the external peer review? Or is New Jersey or somebody else going to coordinate the actual assessment itself and just bring us the peer review to do? I think we're looking for a collaborative effort. I, I don't have the answer, but the two biggest challenges in one of these areas are one, having the science, and two, having the money. We have the science, it's there, it's ready to go, and we have a significant portion of money ready to go to start that process. And hopefully we can get some other people on board, other states on board, with seeing that through. So those are typically the two greatest challenges. Doing the science, having the money, we've got those items started. So I, I would look for, again, I, I'd have to look for some help here in what the best way forward is as a partnership in getting this done. And I appreciate any guidance you can provide. Tony? Just one more question for clarification. Um, when you say you have the science, does that mean the assessment is ready to go for peer review now, or do we need to involve the states and um, our federal partners and our mid-Atlantic partners in order to actually run the numbers, get the numbers, all of that? Because I only ask that because we need to make sure that we coordinate with all the other assessments that are ongoing, and I would, you know, think that the states would make it a priority, but we also have to balance the other assessments that are currently ongoing for this year. Um, so I will stop there. We would need the help of the states to get all of the typical data inputs that would be at the beginning of the stock assessment workshop process. So this again is requesting uh, the conductance of a state or conductance of a, a stock assessment with all the partners that are involved and a peer review process of it. So we need to include peer review in that uh, motion. Okay, now we need a second. Emerson, okay. We've got a second discussion. I'm going to go to Bob and then Richie, and we'll start moving around. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just trying to make sure the, what this looks like in my mind is what this may look like in reality. Um, the step one, as Adam mentioned, the states and partners would compile the data. Step two is a group of sci external scientists would be contracted to crunch the numbers. And then step three would be ASMFC would find external peer reviewers. And step four is the external peer review happens. So the ASMFC's resource commitment is staff time to help coordinate data compilation and staff time to 
find the peer reviewers and, and set up and run the peer review, essentially. So the, the resource commission wouldn't be directly putting in staff scientist time or financial resources of the commission. Is that is what we envision? Because I think if that's not the, the sort of four steps that, that everyone has in mind, we may need to reprioritize some of the commission resources. The, you know, the, we, we don't have money in the budget for this this year. And we didn't, we didn't set aside staff time to work on this yet. They're kind of flat out with other assessments. So that's why I'm asking, just trying to make sure we're all on the same page. Given that question, I'll go to Russell before I go to the other uh, hands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I think you hit it right on the head, Bob. And I, the only thing I, else I would add in there is if ASMFC wanted to, to you know, put more time into it and add their scientific knowledge into that, assessment process. I, I think it's, you know, we're willing to get our scientists to work on this also and, and help coordinate with ASMFC to the best of our ability. So I think that I, this is our priority right now. So I think that's where we would head and make sure that we supply whatever you need. And, you know, as I said, we're going to continue to look for funding and hope other states can join in. So you don't have to use as much time, staff time and, and things of that nature. Okay, I have Richie White, uh, Robert Boyles, Michelle Duval, and Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I think Bob answered my question, but um, I mean, it seems like the Commission is moving forward with an external stock assessment and peer review. And as long as Bob's clarification is that it's not Commission money that's going to fund it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I guess the second piece would be, is there a, um, a timeline by which the Commission will come back with an answer of, you know, when are we going forward with this or, so I don't know if you want that part of it or not as to what's the timeline. Anybody want to answer timeline? Uh, Adam. Well, again, the hope would be, the timeline would be for 2018 management use. Now, what, what would that look like? A best case scenario would be having the outputs of that work peer reviewed and then have the Mid-Atlantic SSC look at that as part of their July meeting which is typical June, July, which is typically when they look at making quota recommendations that the Summer Flounder Board then looks at at the joint August meeting. That would be an absolute best case scenario, probably unlikely. That being said, the Black Sea Bass and Summer Flounder and SCUP Management Board in two weeks is going to meet jointly and look at redoing the black sea bass quota for 2017 after the SSC looked at it. So for 2018 management use, I think having the timeline we would need to have that would be by the end of the year, which at which point the Mid-Atlantic SSC could then look at that, revise a recommendation that might have been made earlier in the year and would meet that 2018 management use timeline. Hope that helps to some degree. Robert Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think I understand the frustration and the, um, the need to do this. And so I, I'm trying to get my hands around what this means for us. And I just would like to remind the policy board that we've spent a lot of time developing the 2017 action plan, laying out priorities for the commission, what needs to be done, and, and there are things that need to be done that we collectively agreed we could not do by virtue of um, constraints on time and money. And, and I'm not clear, I'm, I don't know that I can support the motion given the fact that we've been very deliberate about going through and planning out our work plan for the year. Thank you. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the risk of stepping into a quagmire that I 
generally try to stay out of. Um, but it seems like just given some of the concerns raised about coordination with the Mid-Atlantic Council, again, naive about this, but it seems like it might be a conversation to have during that joint meeting that's coming up in a couple of weeks just to make sure that everybody is on the same page in terms of taking an alternative approach. So I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to support this motion at this time. Thank you. Rob O'Reilly. Yeah, I, I appreciate what Adam and Russ uh, are indicating here. At the same time, the uh, Kitty Hawk meetings coming up. I think this has been an advancement since the December joint meeting, and it did feel as if the information was squeezed um, into a pretty narrow scope of thinking. Um, the council certainly is on record saying they're going to wait till after the MRIP data. There was a little back and forth. Um, Adam wanted to make that motion anyway. He did, and that's fine. But I think now what's needed is to, with this new information, because there is some new information now and some new direction that wasn't available um, in December, to either ask Bob or perhaps Doug, I'm not sure who does this, just to get a little window of time that this will be discussed in Kitty Hawk. Because, you know, there's some real hurdles to overcome here. One is time. I mean, would there be a CDAR approach with three different meetings required? Um, gathering the data is difficult. The council already does that on a routine basis. Uh, Dr. Tercero has been doing this assessment for 20-some years, probably. I mean, I'm trying to think of how long, but a long time. And there are nuances with the assessment. Um, you know, it just seems that if we don't have everyone's expertise pulled together because it's a joint plan, um, we're liable to make missteps that we wish we hadn't made. I don't doubt the um, sincerity and, and the need. Um, I think Emerson has categorized the way I feel, which is we are looking for corroboration. When you have a model and uh, it's telling you that year after year, there's retrospective pattern that is, and also indicating that what you thought was a great recruit class of 2009 is now, it's above average still, you know, it's above 42 million or whatever the average is. Um, but there are recruitment situations, as John McMurray said, that have to be dealt with. There's natural mortality that has to be dealt with. The sort of melding of the male and female different natural mortality rates that occurred maybe eight years ago. Time's hard to pinpoint sometimes. There are a lot of things that have to be uh, pulled together beyond just wanting to get a product, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, so fundamentally, I think this is good information, but I want to make sure everyone who's involved, the council, because of the federal waters uh, connotation and the ASMFC because of the state waters, that you know, everyone is on board. And there might be something to gain at this joint meeting um, in terms of some direction that hasn't been thought of since December. So with that, uh, I'd be in a tough place to, to say that I can support this at this point. I think we can do this through negotiation with the council. I think we ought to do that first. Okay. I have... Uh a whole, I have Jay, and I have a whole bunch of hands, but I want to make clear here we're running about half an hour over, so I'm going to ask that everybody be succinct in their, uh, in their points, and then we'll take a vote on this. I'm going to go to Jay, and then I'm going to start uh, working. I'm going to go to uh, Terry because he hasn't spoken, and then I'll come back around to that side. And Eric, who hasn't spoke. Okay, so again, succinct. Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'll try to be real quick. I have two concerns, and, and I'm struggling over here because 
I like all of the things that are being discussed. I like this idea of unique ways of trying to take some of the pressure off a really packed assessment schedule. I, you know, I think this is all positive, but two concerns. The first is what assurances do we have that we do all of this work and that the federal government, who we jointly manage this species with, would actually use the information? And so I think that leads to having to wait and, and hash through this with the council. And the second is a concern about <clears throat> science is a process. It evolves through time. And to not have Mark Tessero, as Rob O'Reilly mentioned, who's been doing this assessment for decades, knows summer flounder and the data and the assessment better than anyone, to not have him involved would be problematic in my view. Um, and so some sense of whether Mark would be able to be a part of this, I think it would be really difficult for an uninitiated group to come in with this species and produce a product that's ready to go right from the get-go. So there needs to be some continuity with the work that's been going on for the past couple of decades um, as well. Thank you. Terry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm in support of the concept, but I'm concerned about the motion. And Jay touched upon it, but what's been missing in this conversation has been outright collaboration with the Science Center. And uh, without the Science Center's support, both for the, um, for the assessment and for the peer review, it's probably going to go nowhere. So um, I would urge um, those who support the, uh, this alternative uh, external stock assessment to consider that. Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I can't add to any of the comments that have been made except for the fact that this is a this is a unique situation where it's actually going to be funded externally from the ASMFC or any other organization and any other council. Um, to be offered that opportunity is something I really think we need to look at. Uh, but there are so many hurdles to overcome. If one of them is not money, I, I think we should at least look at it. So there was a point made about the Science Center collaboration, and in the back of the room is John Hare. He might be able to provide some input to that particular uh, question. You know, obviously the Science Center is interested in developing the best science possible, and there's a lot of promise to Dr. Sullivan's model, and we've been working closely with him in the development of it. Um, I think this issue uh, illustrates some of the questions that we have with the assessment process generally. Um, and I think that those issues need to be dealt with at the NRCC. Um, so, you know, as Science Center Director, you know, I, you know, I'm neutral on this. I think it's good to have the debate and get the issues on the table. Um, and then we will uh, do the best we can to support ASMFC, no matter how this comes down. Um, but we also need to have the conversation at the NRCC about the assessment process in general. And many of those issues are being brought up here. Um, so my position is neutral. We will support what decision is made. Um, I will add two other points. Um, the question came up about assembling the data. Uh, Mark Tessero is assembling the data already as part of a model data update. Um, so, you know, there need, you know, that would be, that could be leveraged off. Um, and then the other issue which comes into sort of the peer-reviewed piece of this is uh, Dr. Sullivan's model is a sex-based model um, and how sexes are assigned to time periods when there is no sex data available is something which needs to be worked out in the scientific review, peer review process. And that hasn't been discussed here yet. So we will support, uh, do our best to support the ASMSC and the MAFMSC and the NA. FMNC and GARFO uh, to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, Adam, and then Mike. You'll have the last bite, and then uh, we'll we'll move this question. Great. So first, let me thank everyone for this discussion. I know it's probably been a larger chunk of time. I, I, I won't extend that. I'll 
just build on, thank you, Dr. Hare, for your comments. Really, Dr. Hare and the Science Center have been very involved with Dr. Sullivan. Uh, Jay touched on having Mark involved. Mark Tessero has been involved with Dr. Sullivan from very early on, helping get the data, et cetera. He's seen what's going on. We would certainly hope he could be involved in the process. Uh, to Robert's comment about his level of questioning about the action plan, lucky for us it already is. Task 1.1.85, support the development of a sex specific specific stock assessment modeling approach for summer flounder. So it, it's there already if that makes you more comfortable. And finally, I'll add that what this motion says is explore moving forward. As I said, we've got the heavy pieces there, the beginnings. We need the help with the coordination. That's what I see this motion as, that staff could look at what are, how do we put all these pieces together now? How do we make it happen? Come back, give us some guidance, give the NRCC perhaps some more information, but it helps us formulate the picture of how it happens. This isn't, we're not saying do it, we're saying help us paint the full picture so we can all decide how to get this done and appreciate your support. Thank you. Mike. Finding money would seem to be the easy part of this conversation, but nothing else to add. Uh, call the question. Hey, I'm calling the question to you. I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds to caucus. Okay, I'm going to call the question. Is everybody ready? All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. All those opposed? One, two, two. Abstentions? One, two, three. And no votes. The motion carries uh, 12. 13. 13 to two. Excuse me, 13 to two to three to zero. Uh, any other items to come before the uh, Policy board. Seeing none, I'm Kathy. going to Thank Kathy. Kathy. Sorry, I went right by you. I will be very brief. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to go back to a point that was made a long time ago about uh, consternation that is brewing, and rightfully so, about the change in the MRIP estimates given the various calibrations that have been started and the significant one that will be coming down the road for the changeover from the Coastal Household Telephone Survey to the FES, the Fishing Effort Survey, to add to the acronym soup that uh, was already listed. One of the things that I encourage you all to do is when you have access to at your state offices members that are on the MRIP transition team, myself, Tony, probably some other people in this room who I should be remembering but I'm not. Um, are on that team. We attend conference calls discussing how the calibration, particularly taking into account the change in the methodology that started in 2013 and the one that's going to impact, have major impacts, particularly for stock assessments and the new ACLs coming out of them. Um, there's going to be, uh, we are setting up the parameters for a peer review and it's going to be based off of individual, independent, excuse me, experts from the CIE. But there's also the opportunity to put more people on that group and the comments originally started with, as you would suspect, things like um, statistical members from the various uh, councils and, and other state people that have expertise in that. But Tony, and I want to thank her for this, made the very, very excellent point that one of those positions needs to be the commission. And I think relative to the proportion of catch and harvest and effort that the species that is managed through the commission takes, that it would be fantastic if you all could be in contact with your transition team members. And when that comes up for discussion again, to encourage it. I absolutely agree that commission should be one of those positions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kathy, for that. Any other items? Okay, I, I move that, to, uh, that this uh, meeting is adjourned and we'll start Menhaden. Five to ten minutes. Ten minutes.